Let us get back to where we came from when we were curious, when we had, when we were creative, when we were actually equal, despite we had different qualities. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's truly an honor to be here this morning and invite you all. Um, it's actually quite an emotional day, I think, with the journey that we've been on at the D School um, over the last six years. But it's wonderful to be able to celebrate the next three days with you, as well as the opening tomorrow night, which I think will be a very special occasion, not only for us here in Cape Town, but also for Africa. Um, and very much what this, this building stands for. Um, so welcome to the third Decon Festival, first one in Africa. Um, truly excited to be hosting it on this continent and also to have the opportunity to invite a whole network of African universities to Cape Town to really start and kick, well, kick start um, a, a D-School network across the continent. Because that's really what our vision was when we started off. Um, this journey six, six years ago here in Cape Town. A special thank you to the Hester Platinum Foundation for making this happen. Um, you know, I think it's the vision, the visionaries um, that are out there that can see the opportunity, um, which really something like this wouldn't be able to um, happen. So a special thank you to, to Hasso Plattner, Sabine Plattner, Christina Plattner, and Stephanie Plattner for really supporting this over the six years and, and just being part of this journey. I think we really have started something very special. Thank you. So this is a third part of a series, a global series of design thinking activities. Uh, we had the, the design thinking impact um, conference in Potsdam about three, four weeks ago, um, celebrating their 15th um, yeah, the 15th anniversary, and over the last three weeks, we've been had students from around the world working with the design think on the design thinking alliance with a global design thinking challenge, um, of which the finalists will be announced on Friday. And really looking forward to that. And this is the third piece of the puzzle: three-day Decon Festival, where really we've attracted thought leaders from around the world. I think if you look at the mix of uh, participants, it really does talk to the depth and breadth of design thinking. We have people here from government, from academia, from business, from development agencies, students, academics, um, private sector. It's just so amazing to see the power that design has crossing all these disciplines. And that's really what, what we are about. I won't talk too much about the building. We'll do a little bit more of that tomorrow in the, at the opening. Um, but the next three days, as Africa mentioned, is about celebrating design thinking, its journey since the early days at Stanford, um, and how it's evolved to interrogate how it's worked, what's working, what's not working, to look at the depth of design thinking, and really to challenge our, a lot of our own thinking and, and see where we need to start to build going into the future. And that pulls us into the anticipation side of what's next. A building like this, location in Africa, the opportunity we have with the network across the world, where, where can we take this mindset, this way of thinking, um, and really start to make a difference on this world and the complexity that we, that we face. So I've spent my entire life in the design innovation space. Um, and I've never come across an individual person who is so passionate and dedicated and visionary and so personally invested in leveraging the power of design as a driver of change and innovation. So somewhere in between being a software engineer, an entrepreneur, a businessman, a visionary, a master yachtsman, a father, and a philanthropist, Hasse Plattner has single-handedly been the catalyst of starting this global design thinking movement back at Stanford in uh, early 2000s. And then to move this into a European space, 2007, at the start of the D School at Potsdam University. 
And now this amazing facility on the African continent where we started this journey back in 2016. He has truly changed how people perceive the discipline of design forever. The fact that at this conference we have such a mix of amazing delegates, as I've mentioned, is a real true testament to the power of this early visionary back in 2004 and the work that's been happened through the D schools around the world since then. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome onto the stage Professor Dr. Hasso Platner. Let's get back to where we came from, when we were curious, when we had, when we were creative, when we were actually equal, despite we had different qualities. Hasso, thank you for making the time to come out to South Africa for the opening of this wonderful building um, and for making the trip out here. Thank you for having me, it's fantastic. Thanks, Tina and everybody else. So back in 2004, um, the early days before you um, actually were introduced to design thinking or the, the team at Stanford, tell me how you first came across design thinking and what led you to um, your interest in the work that the guys at Stanford University were doing and, and the investment into the D-School. My company, SAP, had a customer event in New Orleans and uh, in the green room preparing for my speech, I got a business week and on the title of the business week was um, something about design thinking and I flipped over to page 46 and read an article about design thinking and a company I didn't know in Palo Alto. Um, simultaneously, they were sitting in a TV room um, linked to the internet and watching my speech. And I was totally surprised that a software company is now talking about design thinking in my keynote speech. I, invested five minutes and uh, shortly after that I visited Stanford and I visited the um, the company IDEO. Mm, IDEO. Yeah, IDEO. And, um, and then I had a meeting, they dragged me into a meeting with six professors, Stanford professors, who all talked simultaneously. So I, <laughs> I thought that is a sign of high intelligence, <laughs> how they do this. And uh, then uh, somebody took me aside and said, yeah, yeah that's a little bit weird, but uh, we want to do something new, a school of design thinking, and how about you finance it? <laughs> this is the American way of <laughs> doing it. And um, yes, I co-financed it, and uh, so I became part of the the early days and uh, spent some time there and learned about the uh, why it is intriguing and why is it difficult and why is it close to be part of a trade school and how can you defend your position in academia. Um, I, in a final presentation by some teams, the president of Stanford, Hennessy, came and we stood in the back and chatted a little bit quietly. And then he said, I got it, I got it. The students learn to trust themselves how to innovate. And I said, that's it. Remember that. Trust yourself that you can innovate. So whatever we do, whether we do clap, 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 or other things um, to free our emotions, um, in the end, it should stimulate you, it should stimulate teams to trust themselves that they can innovate. Even if they start from scratch and have no clue, and there are a few tricks, 
in the curriculum how to how to be most likely successful starts with need finding something typical engineers don't like engineers know what they want to do they want to invent something they want to build something present it to the so-called users train them push them I said that's as good as it gets I did it all my life um, we can talk about this yeah. later but the important part the important part is to be open to learn what users whether users are humans or systems what they really need from their point of view not from the engineering point of view the old days you study something you have a plan and then you execute along the plan and a waterfall model is really over who does that does not produce anything which will change the future of the world yeah. and the success that you saw in those early days at Stanford um, but three years later you invested in starting D school in Germany at uh, HPI campus tell us your your thinking behind that and bringing bringing this sort of way of thinking to to the continent to Germany I thought this is especially necessary for um, an engineering culture in Germany which is a little bit stiff the engineers are ruling the world and they are right it's not in your league but I had Porsches all my life in your league yet I hope soon um, Porsche doesn't have didn't have a copy a coffee cup holder no you don't drive with a hot coffee in Germany at 220 kilometers on the Autobahn no you don't do this um, so they didn't have one they also had a front hood which when you pressed it down you had a dent in because it was of aluminum when you opened the door and it was a little bit cold you squeezed your fingers women lost their fingernails when you push the clutch and you have high heels on it's very difficult because the clutch was so hard they they were confronted Porsche I was working at Porsche at this time or for Porsche as a consultant can't you change these things no <laughs> it is a car for men <laughs> at this point in time Porsche was losing market share they desperately needed female drivers and they just pushed them away when they went to a showroom and opened the door and squeezed their fingers uh -uh, honey we go for the Honda they didn't learn this they nearly went bankrupt got a new CEO and he invited 10 ex engineers from um, Toyota they came in their white outfits like doctors walked around the car and guess what they found all these things the door handle the hood the clutch and other ones changed them ever since I don't know the current numbers but the number of female drivers is at least over 30 percent without that they wouldn't be on a stock market now yeah so that this I, I had this in my mind and when I saw then what these guys were discussing that we have to do real need finding nobody ever asked at Porsche ladies what they think about the handling of a Porsche not the looks not the speed not the horsepower we don't do this as German engineers we know what is right for the customer mm -hmm. and that was for me mm -hmm. the reason to start a D school in in Potsdam in an engineering school for computer science I still have my problems with the computer science guys 
They think they don't need it. They know better. And it is so obvious that especially the computer guys have to understand design thinking. I'll give you one example. Tesla. Tesla has done now everything, all controls of the car over a touchscreen. Good idea. Cheap to manufacture, easy to maintain. Mm -hmm. It's all good. How do you reach the climate control, which is in the bottom right corner while you're driving? Nobody ever in the test, in the lab scenario for the design of the screen went behind the test person and shook the chair. Hmm. How do you handle the touch screen when the car is rocking? You can't. And it's so small that you can't even see it. Even Tesla. It is a blatant misdesign of climate control in a, in a modern e-car. Why? They didn't go to a D-school course. They didn't. <laughs> Despite their own Palo Alto, they could have. Even the most brilliant engineers have to understand how humans feel, how users feel, how they behave. Just a second person rattling a little bit the backrest of the chair and it became clear that the, um, um, that the little icons are too small, too far away and from the side you can't see them. Could have been avoided, will be avoided in the future, but only through negative feedback from customers. So I thought we can do better, still a hard fight. There's one thing I want to start with. Design thinking is not a fun discipline just to relax and do something which is different than math, physics, or economics. It is as hard, probably harder. Yes, you can laugh. Yes, you can have fun. Yes, you can do clap, 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 clap. But you also have to really use your brain in the group to improve something from the user's point of view. Thank you. And looking at your foundation, in, in 2013, you joined the Giving Pledge. Um, what inspired you to start your foundation? Well, that was always uh, on the horizon, so I... Uh, probably the contact with Bill, Bill Gates, he, very early on said, uh, I cannot give my money to my son and my daughter. This is there's too much pressure mm -hmm. if they have this on top of them. So they, they got quite a solid outfit and the rest went uh, to foundation and uh, 13 was probably the right point in time to mm -hmm. set up the foundation and finance some of these mm -hmm. uh, um, interesting but, projects. Uh, and tell us about some of the projects that you finance, because it's not just the D schools around the world. There's a number of very exciting projects that the foundation yeah. supports. Here in South Africa, that was the uh, Richard Research Support uh, for AIDS, and then Treatment of AIDS. Um, did not achieve what I hope we achieve, that we get an early vaccine. I thought South Africa could bypass the rest of the world with a vaccine. Didn't happen. Um, I financed a few projects in Germany uh, to restore old buildings, mm. like the castle in Potsdam or, or others, the university in Mannheim. Um, biggest project was um, my computer science institute in Potsdam, which I'm very proud of that became a leading um, computer science institute in German-speaking Europe uh, for several years back to back now, and um, which is also 
physically the location for the design school mm. in Potsdam. I just want to come back to the design process and uh, to, to cast some light on why it's hard. For me as a German, the hardest part was probably step three or four in the Stanford um, procedure to articulate a point of view. One sentence where I normally would use a full page to write it down. So what does that help you? I learned this later. What does that help you is turn the things around in your head as long as needed to find an overall articulation what the project is for. Hard. It's easy to say we want to be the good doers. Um, we have a purpose. It's all easy. No, nope. to be more precise, but not start waffling. But one of the biggest problem in projects is that we not only start waffling, but that we wander out and do all kinds of things. And especially in a group, people want to do, I do this, I do that, I become a specialist, and they lose a little bit the coherence of the group. So for Tesla, it would be out of my hand. Um, we want to control all functions of the car via a touch screen while we are driving. The while we are driving is the hard part. To sit in a lab kind of environment, many people can do it. Mm. While we are driving, much more difficult. So if you can articulate this point of view and always look back in the project, are you still within the boundary of this point of view? Or do you have to change the project definition? Have to start from the end users again, whatever the end users are. Start again, not just feedback and check whether your project is on a on a right tra trajectory. When we developed a new UI, probably six, seven years ago, for some SAP products, I told the head, he was a board member, have you done enough end user analysis? Yes, we have done this and we have all these documents and videos and now we are programming. And you're not going back to them? No, not, not, not at the moment. So we, we, are, we are busy programming now. What was the verdict for the UI? Clumsy. German, difficult to use, brand new, brand new. You have to go back to the users once you have a prototype. Therefore, whether the prototype is wireframe or whatever, um, you have to get the permanent buying of the original end user group because they get better. With each iteration, they know more and can tell you more. You have to use that. If you don't use that, it is this engineer throwing at the wall whatever comes out of the brain and see what sticks. And then you have a patchwork of a system missing some major points, have some highlights, looks good from an engineering point of view, and misses the end users. What your chance is here um, in Africa to be even more user-oriented than we um, falling back to some extent again and again. Um, without saying something too negative, Africa is known, not known for a great engineering country, but you can compensate with great user orientation. Um, there is some hope for that, that is the um, culture in arts. Mm. This is the um, more expressive way of living than probably in cold Germany. 
you have a chance to do something for the users and you have different users here, all kinds of education levels, um, that you can build something mm. which is superior to what comes out of a uh, high-tech engineering country mm. like, like Germany. That's what I believe is a chance for you guys here. Um, so design thinking has a touch of uh, what you learn at the trade school, but it has a real deep, nearly philosophical background of taking yourself back and listening to what the users, customers, even if the customer is a system, really wants. When we build systems and we want to connect them, then we always, we always fall back and think inside out. Instead, really studying what does the other one expect from us? What would be the easiest way to do things? What would be easy to install, easy to maintain? In many aspects, Americans are superior because they go for easy stuff. They have the coffee cup handle in all cars, even the cheapest, since 30 years. So this part of being really passionate about achieving something which is the most convenient, also effective, of the potential mm. solutions. To work in teams, I don't know how big the teams are you work in, but when I was at Stanford, we worked in teams of five or six. And with all the exercise around, we were, we were driven to accept to work as a team and not to build a hierarchy. There's a team leader, there's the assistant team leader, this is the one who is close to them and there's a fifth wheel on the team. Hierarchical teams go mostly in one direction. One thing we have to break this up. Yes, there are people who are more talented. There are faster programmers. There are faster mechanical engineers. But the others can contribute and we have to motivate each other that they can contribute, then the brain is not one and a half, but probably four and a half, which is significantly more. Um, I have not seen where design thinking is not applicable. Um, the focus on mechanical engineering or computer science is obvious from the beginning and I'm very grateful that it happened here, that the mechanical engineers uh, have detected the D school and are using it. This is helpful for them. Um, the computer science, they also need this. They have worldwide um, complexity problems. Um, so work in, to learn to work in small groups and accept everyone in the group as a contributing member, not just a workforce. This doesn't mean to discuss things to death. You have to learn there's always this time pressure. Very important, time pressure. You have to do everything under time pressure. That means you cannot discuss things endlessly. You have to cut and make a decision and then you go ahead. So there are many things you can learn in design thinking projects which are applicable to everything else. Um, the good thing is it's not straight to the marks of your, uh, of your main study. The bad thing is it doesn't even count. So we have to work on that, uh, that we get recognized. Um, the more exciting the projects are, you, you produce and you can demonstrate to others. You know that, excuse me, who is Cape Town University here? People. You know you are a conservative university. 
great university, conservative university, looks great. Um, there are many skeptics here on campus uh, and think, what are they doing there? This trade school stuff there. When they came in in the first 10 minutes and clap, 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 clap. <laughs> <laughs> a normal math professor, so what are they doing? Design thinking. <laughs> um, you have to show to your peers that, that this is a serious discipline. Um, to some part, you have to work on the academic um, trajectory, you have to um, write papers, you have to find things which are applicable and can be taught, the hard part, and you have to run projects which can have uh, a symbolic character. And, and sticking with the theme in Africa, I mean, uh, about four or five years ago when we were early days when we were discussing this building, your, your, your basic brief uh, to me and the team was think visionary right there think a hundred years into the future and think iconic what, what is your vision for the D school in Africa now you know what I just said that we that we get stronger as a team that the people who went through the D school show in their professional life that they can go an extra mile, that they can lead teams, that they can bring teams together and invent something. Move forward, build something new, improve the life, whether this is in healthcare, this is in um, traffic control. I still cannot believe why traffic lights are so stupid in 2022. <laughs> You all are permanently on an iPhone or equivalent and talking to each other, uh, informing everybody else in the world what is going on in your life. And the stupid traffic robots cannot talk to each other and synchronize. I don't know how it is in South Africa, but on the way to South Africa, I was in Italy a little bit. In Germany, they are so stupid. Uh, they have not really improved in the last 30 years. Probably it's too expensive and we prefer to uh, get stuck in traffic. Yeah. So traffic is an area. Healthcare is a huge area where we can improve. Guess what? The reigning um, class in hospitals, they don't want to be regulated by computer systems. I have to admit it's much better in South Africa than in Germany. In Germany, we fight a losing battle in large um, university hospitals to mm. share data. The professors don't want to share data, it's their data. So there, there is a lot which could be done. Sometimes you cannot do it because the political power is not behind. Uh, the society is not behind, but nevertheless, you have to push. Mm. And you will have breakthroughs, and uh, I hope that the contribution of the Capetonian D School is a special one. Because you have a different situation in this country and that stimulates probably more than when you sit in a uh, well-organized uh, environment like in Germany where you study for five years and then you go to Porsche and get, um, get the new yeah. chairs and become rich. Um, so you have to fight a little bit more and I hope that you can do this. Thank you. The ironic thing is, in, in this country, we call traffic lights robots. Yeah. And, uh, I said that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, it's, we, said we haven't moved on. We're quite happy with the intelligence of the robots that we have <laughs> <laughs> developed in this country.
Um, do they have questions? Or yeah, we can. I've got. I've got one more question, and we can quickly open to the floor. If there's a roaming mic um, around, knowing what you know now, um, after all these years, what would you have done differently around the D schools in design thinking? Not much. You can you can stimulate, uh, and this building is a stimulation. Um, you can push, but in the end, it depends on the people, what they do, what they come up with. Um, so, everybody who comes to the D school has to have a main subject, an ordinary university degree. This is mandatory. You cannot just be a design thinker. You can use design thinking in your domain and what you have studied. So I hope this yeah. is the case here yeah. as well. But then it can be um, an advantage to have this design thinking background. I even believe it's more important than uh, some kind of entrepreneurial studies. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, fo uh, I'm biased. I think uh, design thinking is uh, is more helpful. Um, I never studied anything about entrepreneurship and now they call me entrepreneur. So yes, uh, probably lucky. It is easier to learn. This is, if you really want to become good at it, it is hard. And it is against the grain. At least in, in Europe, um, university studies are focused on one single person. Single person has to optimize. We do as much as possible at the HPI in Potsdam mm. that they have to do group work mm. because the rest of the life is working in groups. You don't work alone. And you, the better you can work with others without putting them down, without using them as work slaves, uh, or fight for their position that you can replace them, all the stuff what's happening in corporate, mm. in the corporate world. Yeah. Um, you learn here and you can really, you can really use. Mm. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. I think, yes, I think we've got a few minutes. Um, any questions from the floor? That's not good for design thinking uh, if you... Uh, <laughs> any questions? This one over here, Rob. <coughs> you spoke about systems as users almost. Um, what about complex problems? How do we apply design thinking to solving the complex problems? Not just the cup holder in the car, but the car congestion, the air pollution. Is there a space for design thinking there? Yeah, if you have alternative ideas, I would say it's not helpful if you want to build a Hoover Dam or one of your big dams here. Mm. This is raw engineering at its best. Design thinking cannot really help so much. At least I have difficulties to see that you cannot build an aircraft with design thinking. But with design, design thinking, you can change probably some traditional ways of flying. Boarding is one. Um, alternative ideas, wherever, wherever something got stuck, we do this since 50 years and this is the right way to do it. There is probably an opportunity to think about laterally Mm. Couldn't we do it differently? Uh, I was so intrigued at Stanford when the students had to go to a kindergarten to ask the kindergarten folks, what would you do if you had money and you can change your playground? It was not so important what the changes are. It was important that the students learn to talk to five to six year old kids and accept them as 
as a real source of information, not just little kids, you have to tell them what to do. So this, this kind of openness um, can, can apply to any kind of uh, system situation which got stuck. Um, we are now in a situation with the gas crisis in Europe um, where we think laterally in all directions uh, to come up with an idea. And probably somebody comes up with an idea, we can apply. Um, it is not a, I said this already, it is not a replacement for solid engineering knowledge. Thank you. I think we got another question at the back there. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Professor, there's so much uh, injustice worldwide, um, environmental injustice, social injustice. Uh, there's a north-south divide in many ways. Um, how, how do we inspire the resources of the world to tackle the challenges in Africa and to, to assist with those? And how do we um, take a university like Cape Town University, which would ordinarily send its best students into the top companies to perpetuate uh, financial capital and wealth, and how do we steer those energies and talents into environment and social uh, justice? Yeah, it's difficult. So the, the injustice was there for the last 10,000 years. So um, the attempts to solve the distribution of wealth and justice by capping everything and make everything on an, uh, put on an equal level, that fails because then the average level goes down. You can study this in the history of the Soviet Union and the affiliates. So that's a hard part. The best part is to make the whole, the society as a whole, efficient and successful. And it's hard what I say now, but as African nations, you have to look to the Asian nations, how they did it. Nobody helped them. Nobody gave them money, probably except South Korea. They did it by themselves. And not only the mainland China, Taiwan, the Vietnam, the other ones, they're all starting to thrive. And it's education, get rid of corruption, and, and steer from the government. But the government cannot solve it. Government projects cannot solve it. They can stimulate here and there. The the society has to solve it, I believe. But the society has to get the means to become successful. Number one, education. Therefore, we are here and I am investing here. Uh, there are other areas, healthcare, etc., um, transportation, where the government has the major say in. But as soon as possible, the society, mm. private, the private market has to take over because then there is competition, then there is um, there is progress because of competition and surviving of the fittest. But a uh, an Elysium we will not be able to achieve. A society has to start or has to, not to start, has to work hard to achieve it. And mm. the Asians have done this. Thank Politically you, correct? Absolutely, thank you. I think that's time and one last question. Just over here. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask, what is your perspective um, in the role that um, um, design thinking can play in career development and planning, given that it's such a crucial decision that um, 
kids have to take maybe at a very early age to avoid them like um, for instance maybe you're in your fourth year and you realize that this is not actually the career that I wanted to take so what do you think um, design thinking can do to to play that role well, first of all I would not give up the original direction of your university study it is lifelong a handicap there are famous people who have overcome this Bill Gates Mark Zuckerberg uh, etc etc probably more in the uh, Silicon Valley have no university degree than a university degree is probably not true mm -hmm. but it, it's not over without a university degree it's just better with, so be careful with that design thinking can help on top of that can just widen your, uh, your view that you can see things others ignore because it's not on the straight, straight path forward. Um, we have good examples of um, people who followed the curriculum and, uh, and how, they, how they fared in their, in their business. Um, I hope that this will be the case here as well. We need in South Africa, you need, you need a young generation of leaders in, not only political leaders, leaders in business who produce something, who bring the country forward by new products, by better products, cheaper products, um, new ideas. New ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think we're at time. Um, Hasso, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. Um, and once again, for coming out here. I think it's hugely, hugely appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. everybody.